Okay, so let's start. Let's go on with the next talk. The next talk is presented by Josh Long. He's a real Java champion. He says so. Um, and pardon me? Oracle says so. Oracle says so. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's find out. Uh, he's talking about Java native apps. Cloud native apps. Right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you? That was just terrible. Good morning. Oh, I suppose it's now afternoon anyway. Is that why you're correcting me? You're so hesitant because it's now afternoon. So I appreciate you being here. I know that there's a lot of great talks you could be at right now, uh, and you chose to spend this time with me, and I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about software today. I care about software. And so I start all my presentations uh, with a GitHub repository that you can follow along with uh, at your own leisure later on, at your own discretion. So I encourage you to note that GitHub repository for now, because we're going to go through so much stuff, and I'm not expecting you to remember every single line of code that we type or every single line of uh, every single concept that we talk about but you'll be able to ground uh, the ideas in the code later on now if you have questions comments feedback whatever I'm happy to talk to you I have uh, I have uh, you know Twitter and I'm happy to talk to you on Twitter how many of you are on Twitter it's it's 2017 Twitter anybody anybody at all okay very good well the rest of you get on it it's the new IRC. It's a great place to be. It's where all the stakeholders that drive the open source that powers your businesses are. And if you want to engage in the community, it is the absolute best place to be. Uh, what, about, what about email? How many of you have email? E, e mail. Email. Anybody? Okay, well, if you're there, uh, find me there if you want as well. I don't particularly like email. I think uh, Twitter's a far more sort of democratic, more open, more uh, free and re reusable approach to learning, but I'll take it any way I can get it, right? So, so find me there if you like. A little bit about me, as was just uh, ably, ably explained, my name is Josh Long. It's so nice to be here. I'm a Spring developer advocate on the Spring team at Pivotal. How many of you know Pivotal? We're a, a small company with, with big dreams, and we have a... We have a really interesting team stacked with lots of inter interesting people from all across the ecosystem. I focus on apps, uh, and I do my level-headed best to help developers and to help people uh, build applications that work well, that fully exploit this uh, new wonderful paradigm of the cloud, right? And so part of that is giving talks to community members, to customers, to organizations like yourselves. And then, of course, part of that is doing training videos and doing books. Now, uh, for those of you who are wondering, that bird on that book cover, and by the way, I can see it in your eyes. I can see the curiosity in your eyes. For those of you who are wondering, that bird is a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird that's indigenous to the Indonesian Java Islands. Now, in English, when we say indigenous, we can also say native to the Java Islands. And a bird, well, birds fly, often in the clouds. And so this is a bird that is native to Java that flies through the clouds. It's a cloud-native Java bird. It, it, it's a bird that's native. Never mind. It'll come. Give it time. Give it time. You'll get it. It's fine. Uh, if you really want to get it, though, you should close your laptops, by the way. We're going to go through a lot of stuff. Like I say, nobody has ever managed to sit through one of my talks staring at Facebook. So if you're going to be here, I'd appreciate it uh, if you give yourself the chance to not waste your own hour. Now, uh, I work in my capacity on several different projects. I'm an open source en engineer as well. I am the leading, number one, top ranked, most highly visible, most lauded, and most recognized contributor to the projects like Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, Spring Batch, Vod, and Time Leaf Activity. Number one contributor of, uh, of bugs, but still number one. Number one, more bugs per commit than any other engineer on these teams. Not fixed, I mean, I created them, but still, it's, it's something, you know? And we, at Pivotal, have a lot of great open source software, so there's plenty of opportunity for folks like me to work on open source projects. You'll recognize some of these projects, I think, uh, on the slide. We have uh, Spring, which is an application development technology we're going to talk about today, but we also have uh, infrastructure, things like RabbitMQ, and we sponsored Redis for the first five years of its life as well. Uh, and uh, we also have something called Cloud Foundry. How many of you know Cloud Foundry? So Cloud Foundry is the most uh, 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 successful sort of private data center, uh, private 
uh, cloud option in the market today. It is the thing that all of your businesses are using probably, and if there aren't already, they will be, right? It's a technology that was founded back in 2011. It's open source. It's Apache 2 licensed, managed by the Linux Foundation. And uh, it helps organizations, large and small, deliver applications and manage them in production. It helps them move quickly from concept all the way to production. And that's what we care about at Pivotal. We care about going to production. We love production. And we see that a lot of organizations are struggling with how to get there faster. They know that they have to go faster, but they don't know how. They've got these large existing monolithic applications written in, a yester in yesteryear, in a time before the era of modern cloud economics were so obvious and so apparent to them. And these applications will, were well designed in the time for which they were conceived, but now, now they, bit, they, they present a bit of an obstacle. These applications are typically large, they're unbroken, they have large amounts of people working on them. They take a long time to see uh, any changes reflected in the final production environment. These monolithic applications are frustrating because it takes a lot of people to see any change at all. And organizations know that work flows through a, 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 a cycle, there's a, a sort of a, a uh, production line, a pipeline from development to QA, some from product management to to, uh, to user experience, to developers, to administrators, and often to production. And they see that work moves slowly through that pipeline. Most organizations try to optimize parts of the pipeline, but they fail to optimize the whole thing. And so the result is the same thing. They still see that it takes a long time to see any results. Even if you've got developers doing agile development, you know, doing test-driven development and maybe pair programming and so on, as we do at Pivotal Labs, maybe you've got that, but the rest of the, or the pipeline if it's not so optimized, if it's not agile, if it's not optimized for fast feedback, will slow you down and you won't get the benefits of it. So what we see is that organizations struggle with this progression. They struggle with this idea of taking their existing applications and changing them more rapidly to meet market, marketplace demands. And a big part of that is because of the size of the application. They know that the successful companies out there are all software companies that even if, they've, even if they're large, they still deliver software as though they're small companies. Even the really big companies today still release software like small companies, and that's the key, we think. How quickly can your team release software, release interesting working software? And so a lot of organizations turn to this microservices architecture. This idea is very simple. It's based on an insight that uh, Mel Conway seized uh, in the 1970s. It says that software is a mirror image of the organization that builds it. And if you have a crappy organization, then you'll have a necessarily crappy piece of software. It's up to you to optimize your organization to better impact that software. This is called the reverse Conway maneuver. They've done plenty of uh, studies to confirm this. They've done plenty of examples where they looked at, for example, open source software versus proprietary software. Imagine you had, for an instant, the opportunity to look at the source code for Microsoft Office and then compare it to something of analogous form and function, like OpenOffice. It's just a hypothetical. I've never seen, thankfully, the source code for Microsoft Office. But imagine you had that opportunity. You could look at the code, stare at it in the abyss. You open the code base and it glows. You resist the fervent urge to vomit. You try not to open source your lunch on the floor. But it is a very overwhelming compulsion. Imagine you've managed to now get past that need to vomit in your mouth by looking at the terrible code. What do you imagine you would see? What they realized in these studies is that the software in the old proprietary software, as developed, or as developed by the same team in the same time zone, the sa speaking the same language in the same office hours, has far less modularity. That's because it's so much easier. The cost of communication is so much easier for these people in the same team for them to just switch, turn their chair and say, Jane, I'm going to change this one thing. What do you think about that? Can we you know, have a discussion and make that work? And it's cheap, it costs nothing. But if you're in an open source project, some people contribute in the evening, some people in the morning, some people at night, some people on the weekend, some people not at all for weeks at a time. It's very hard to get everybody in the same room, in the same phone call, in the same email thread even. This, the cost of communication is expensive. And so organizations realize that if you cut down that cost of synchronization in the organization, you can go faster. So they decompose their large applications into smaller microservices. They looked at Dr. Eric Evans. Eric Evans wrote a great book called Domain Driven Design. In this book, he talks about a bounded context. It's a part of the domain, the domain of your application that stands unto itself, internally consistent. It's reusable. If you can identify bounded contexts in your application domain, you have a logical place to 
d divide it, to cut it into smaller pieces, to cut it into smaller microservices. And when you move to this architecture, you're going to face two really big pains. I call them the, the, the hemorrhoids of microservices. Do you know what a hemorrhoid is, my friends? It's a real pain in the uh, <clears throat> The first hemorrhoid that you're going to face when you move to this architecture is how quickly from 0 to 60 can you build a production-worthy service and handle all of the non-functional requirements that are required to do so, all of the things that we need to do. We all understand that we need to do that. And yet, they add nothing to our bottom line. They're not what Adrian Cockcroft and Werner Vogels from Amazon used to describe as uh, differentiated heavy lifting. It's work that you have to do, but that doesn't help you in the market. Things like load balancing and security and monitoring and observability and DNS, all the stuff that you need to do, but that is not in your mission statement, right? You're trying to deliver software for a vertical, for a customer base, not trying to solve the problems of SSL. And yet you have to do it, of course. Most organizations, and I'm not saying yours, of course not yours, but most organizations, and again, I, I really, I know it's not yours not your organizations, but most organizations that I've been to have a wiki page on their internal wiki with 500 easy steps to production. That wiki page is the list of all the things you must do for every single new service in order for it to be production worthy. And that, enemy, that wiki page is the enemy of velocity. The faster you can get through that list, the better. And so for this, I tell uh, people about, I talk to people about Cloud Foundry because Cloud Foundry cares only about your applications. It doesn't care about all the nonsense below it, like containers and RAM and hard disks and Linux in installations and patches and all that. It manages it all for you. So you can focus on the only thing that matters, the application. And then I talk to them about Spring Boot because Spring Boot is purpose built to surface and to integrate with things that we care about, like observability and security and all this kind of stuff, right? Log, correlated logging and so on. The second hemorrhoid that you're going to face is now that I've done this, now that we've built lots of small services deployed over the network, talking to each other across network partitions, we have invited the complexity of building a distributed system into our lives. If you have 10 different REST APIs and you stand them up, you've just made your pain 10 times more painful. REST APIs are uh, prone to failure. They run the risk of uh, running afoul of the fallacies of network computing. You can't pretend that it's just going to work if you have just one of each. There's complexity involved in distribution, and you need to address that as an architectural concern. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is, is that second hemorrhoid. We're going to see ever so briefly a little bit about Spring Cloud, but I'm sorry, Spring Boot, but we're not going to spend too much time there because I really want to talk about what happens when you build a distributed system. So with that, I'm going to close this out. Those are my slides. I hope you like them. What do you think? The best slides you've seen this hour, at least? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I worked hard on those. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application here. I'm going to go to uh, my other shell here. I'm going to go to start.spring.io. This is my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place on the internet is production. I love production. You should love production. Bring your kids. Bring the family. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. I love production and so should you. But if you're not already in production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a new application. It's a Java application. I'm going to build an application using Spring Boot. I'm going to call this the reservation-service. This is just a service that's going to manage entities of type reservation. And to do so, I'll use Spring support for building web application. I'll use H2. Now, H2 is an in-memory embedded SQL database. So it's an in-memory embedded SQL database that is going to lose all of its state on every single restart. It loses the data all the time, very similar to MongoDB in this respect. All the data, all the time, for no reason at all, just randomly losing data, OK? So there's that. We're going to use JPA, the Java Persistence API, because I make terrible life decisions, so JPA. We're going to use Actuator for observability and monitoring concerns. I'm going to use the Config Client for centralized configuration, Eureka for service registration and discovery, Zipkin for correlated and distributed tracing, and uh, maybe that's it, oh, and REST repository support, right? Now, I could elect to switch to the full version, and I'm given a veritable ocean of checkboxes, things that I could add to my application if I had more time. Maybe I want to add Vault. Uh, you know, uh, uh, secure keys management, right? Or maybe I want to add uh, any of these other nice things, just, you know, cons uh, uh, consumer-driven contracts and so on, right? I can do all of that, but for our purposes here now, I think we're fine. Now, uh, one question that people ask is, what language should we use? Well, use whatever you want. Any language on the JVM that supports annotations and objects works just fine. But here, my friends, here, here we have what are 
what I like to think of as non-choices. These are choices that you, you could make, but that you should not. These are non-choices. And that's not just Indian bread, my friends. These are choices in the same way that stripping naked and running in traffic is a choice. You, you could, but, but, but don't. So, for example, what version of the JVM would you like to use in 2017? As both 1.6 and 1.7 are end of life, no longer supported, not available, deprecated, past their prime, stinky, it would be insane to start a new project on either one today. It would be irresponsible and worthy of punishment to continue to use either one today in a production environment. You are risking your organization's ability to function safely. Reconsider. Here we have the choice of packaging, and people get very confused about this, so I'll do my best to explain how, when, and where to choose which. If by some terrible, terrible tragedy of physics in space-time, some freak accident of physics, you find yourself stuck in the distant, distant, distant past, far, far beyond modern help, then choose dot war. But if you're here in 2017 with me, then choose dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching, guiding, personal philosophy of make jar, not war. It's okay. That's a make love, not war joke. Never mind. It's fine. It'll come. Give it, give it time, friends. Anyway, so I'm going to hit generate, and I'm going to go to my command line here, uh, assuming I've got my command line running. Okay. CD downloads. Here we are. Unzip reservation service. CD reservation service. And I'm going to open this up in my IDE, assuming I point it to the right file. There we are. Take some tea. Ooh, ah, that's good stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build an application. I'm going to use my IDE, and it doesn't matter what IDE we use. You can use in, uh, IntelliJ, you can use Eclipse, you can use NetBeans, you can use whatever you want. Uh, anybody here using Emacs? Are you here, sir? Emacs guy? Where's the Emacs guy? He's usually at every talk I do in every continent and every country and every city. It's the same object identity, same human being. I say, who uses Emacs? And he says, I do, and then he leaves presumably to go to the next conference to troll me there. Whatever. Anyway, I've got now a simple build. I've got a, whoops, I've got a simple build. And in my build, I've got some dependencies. These are dependencies that I've specified at start.spring.io. For now, I'm going to comment out the uh, Zipkin bits. I'm going to comment out uh, the, uh, actually, I think that'll do for now. I can, oh, I guess I don't need the config server and Eureka. So we'll leave all that there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a simple application. Oh, I want the compile time code, uh, compile time annotation processor called Lumbach. I forgot about Lumbach. So let's add this. You could have added it at start.spring.io, but I'm going to add that there. So what I want to do is I want to build an application that manages entities in the database. It's a record. It's an ORM, right? I'm using JPA here. And I'm going to manage entities of type reservation, whose primary key is of type long, uh, which has a single column called reservation underscore name, like so. And I'm going to signal that this is a surrogate auto-incrementing primary key value using the JPA annotations. And the right thing to do here at this point would be to create getters, setters, you know, accessors, mutators, constructors, all that nonsense. But I don't want to. I'm lazy. So I'm going to use Lumbach to do that for me. I'll say, create an all argument constructor, a no argument constructor, and so on. And then I have an entity that will work for me. Now, here I can see reservation r, reservation dot can, get reservation name, set reservation name, etc. That all comes for free with Lumbach, right? Uh, I also want a default constructor. So I'm going to say alt insert, give me a constructor with the name. And now I, I want to be able to read and write and persist instances of this record in the database. So I'm going to use a pattern called a, a repository pattern. This is just an object that will save, uh, read, update, delete instances of the object. And now I don't have to implement this interface. Spring Data will do that for me. It has already implied in this interface definition, find all, save, flush, delete, and batch, find by ID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can even do custom finder methods. I can say collection of reservation find by reservation name. And I can say I want to find uh, all the records with that reservation name, right? And that would turn into a query, a dynamic query at runtime uh, like this, right? So, sort of like this. I may type an error here, but roughly the same, right? 
Okay, so there's my, my repository, and I'm going to use that to save some sample records into the database. I'm going to create an object in Spring Boot that gets called when the application starts up. So this is a, a command line runner. When Spring starts, it's going to call this run method, passing in public static void main string args here, which means I can do initialization. Any kind of sort of ETL or batch or anything that has to happen after the application has started but before requests start coming in, I can do here. And I'm, I'm telling Spring I have a constructor, provide that bean as a constructor argument, a collaborating object, and I'm going to write some records to the database. My name is Josh. It's so lovely to meet you. Sebastian? Okay. Very good. Nice to meet you. What about you, buddy? What's your name? How do you spell it, my friend? M-A-L-T-E. Like that? Very good. Nice to meet you. Um, Miss, what's your name? How do you spell it? Like so? Very good. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about you there, sir? What's your name? M-A-X? Very good. Nice to meet you. Mm. Well, okay. Just, I just, you can't leave me hanging here. I need at least three more. It's nice and round. What's your name, my friend? M-A-M-I-C-H-A-E-L? Very good. Nice to meet you. Uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? C-H-R-I-S? Oh, I'm sorry. Like that? Like this? Very good. Nice to meet you. Um, and just one more. What about you, my friend, in the very back there? A-N-D-Y? Very good. Nice to meet you. And so for each name in that list, I'm going to write the record to the database, saving it like that. And I'll confirm that everything's working as expected by visiting every response that comes back System.out print line. And uh, there we go. If we run this code, we should see on the command line, we should see reflected uh, in the output that these names have been written to our little database, which we've got, which is in memory, uh, and everything should be as we expect. So there we are. There's our happy few names. Now, I want to build an API, and of course, I could take the long way home. I could build a, a Spring MVC REST controller like this, reservation REST controller, uh, and then inject the repository, right? And create a constructor, and then just create an endpoint here. Git mapping forward slash reservations, public collection of reservations, and, and so on. And that would certainly work, I think. That would be fine, you know. But I believe that we can do better. That's a lot of wasted code, don't you think? Look at all that extra lines of code that I had to write. So instead of doing that, I'm going to make the repository create a, an API for me. So I'll say repository REST resource. And I'm using Spring Data REST here, right? So here we are, path by name. OK, and I'm going to annotate this with a parameter. And now, before I do that, let me just confirm that everything worked as we expected. So 8080 forward slash reservations. There's our old API, the one that I didn't like, that one that we spent entirely too long writing. So let's go ahead and use Spring Data REST and restart uh, like so. OK, I'll take some tea in the meantime. I think I've earned it. OK, so there's our new API. And the API has in its payloads links. These are hypermedia. It's an implementation of a design pattern called HathiOS, or hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's the idea that every REST resource has enough information in the response for the client to further manipulate that API. Basically, it promotes self-describing services, which, when you move to a distributed systems world, is important because very few developers, and I mean very few, write documentation, and none, absolutely zero, read it. So you need to make it as easy and humane as possible to talk to these services. Now, am I done? Well, probably not, right? I can read and write and put and post and get and delete and all that stuff with this API. I can, uh, I can see uh, information about the pages and the metadata. I have a search endpoint here. I've got all this cool stuff, but am I done? Can I go to production yet? Probably not, though, right? I want to surface information about the application to make it uh, visible. And so what I have on the class path is a module called the actuator. This actuator library provides support for observability. But in order for it to work, we have to disable security in this case, or we can integrate it with an identity provider, which we might do later on. But for our purposes here, let's just disable that security and go now to this endpoint and reservations one and two, and then, then we can go to metrics. And when I go to metrics, it shows me an enumeration of the things like the memory, the heap, the non-heap, the code classes, the counters that have been made, the requests that have been made into the application. I've made two requests to re re reservations forward slash one or two or three, and it had a status code of 200, et cetera. These metrics show me information about the application. There's also uh, ENV, which shows me the environment, the system properties, as well as the environment variables, right? This kind of information here. I've got uh, um, 
mappings, which shows me all of the HTTP endpoints that Spring has, is aware of and the, and the predicates that are required to address them. I've got trace, which shows me by default the last 100 requests that have been made into the application, the timestamps, the time taken, the headers, the paths, all that stuff. Uh, I've got uh, um, info. Now, this is empty. It's up to you to customize this, to put things like the git commit ID or the service ID or the build date uh, up here so you can identify what service is running. When you move to a continuous delivery, every single git push could result in a push to production, hopefully, right? And so this is very important. It be, helps you understand what git push triggered the build that I'm now looking at in my production services. Um, you've also got health. And health shows you a enumeration of all the things in my application that may fail, all the dependencies that may disappear on me. And so I have a, a JSON output, but this also gives me a status code. It's HTTP 200 if everything's OK, HTTP 500 if there's some sort of error, right? So you can use this for load balancing to evict nodes from the load balancing rotation. Now, all of this is not a new idea, right? Google talks about this. They talk about this in their Google Borg monitoring paper. They say, no matter what the nature of the service, if it's big data, or machine learning, or artificial intelligence, or a web service, or whatever, they have a standardized set of endpoints that they use that they then feed to centralized monitoring infrastructure. This helps draw the ever-important single pane of glass, that dashboard that we need in order to understand at a glance what is happening. Now, a cloud-native system, a cloud-native application is four things. It is agile, that is to say it's easy to change. It is observable, that is to say I can monitor it from the outputs of the system. And it is robust in the face of service outages and topology changes. And finally, and finally uh, <clears throat> it is elastic. It takes advantage of the benefits of the cloud, the dynamic, dynamic nature of the cloud. So I have now a observable application. I want to change it, right? I can imagine wanting to change it. I showed you I can use application.properties to change aspects of it. I could change the port, for example. I could say server.port equals 8010. But this is in the code itself. I don't want to recompile my jar just to see reflected in the running application a change in behavior. So instead, I can do a very you know, non-controversial idea. I can use 12-factor style configuration. You see, if I go back here, maven minus d skip tests equals true clean install, YOLO, right? If I go back here and compile the code, I can see in the target directory here, I've got a fat jar, right, or <clears throat> an American jar, right? Now, this jar has 30 megabytes. It has everything I need to run this code. It's self-contained. So java minus jar reservation service dot jar, right? Now, that jar, that jar is self-contained. I can add this as an attachment to an email, and I can send it to my dear, dear grandma and grandpa. They're super, super smart people, but they're not really great with computers. They could run this. So if your operations teams have trouble with this, if they insist on using WebSphere, they don't know how to run it, tell them to call, call my grandma. She's very nice. She has cookies. She'll help them get to production faster. Now, that said, are we done? Is this production? Just starting and stopping a jar? Eh, probably not, right? Let's be honest. So, I, and I also want to be able to change things as I promote it from one environment to, to another, dev, Q&A, staging, etc. So, as I say, I want to change, for example, the port. I can say here, d.server.port equals 8011 or 80. 11, there, voila. And then I'm overwriting it. This is 12-factor style configuration, named, of course, for the 12-factor manifesto from Heroku from 2009 or 10, right? So not, not a new idea. And this is certainly good enough. It's a good start, but we can do better. How do I centralize my configuration if I've got multiple services? How do I audit the configuration, see what changed and when, and then uh, reload it based on that if I need to, or roll it back? How do I reload it live while the service is running? Right? How do I do secure information, passwords, credentials, that kind of stuff? I don't want that on my file system laying around at rest unencrypted. So for these reasons, I need something a little bit better. So I'm going to use the Spring Cloud Config Server. The Config Service is just that. It's, a, it's an API that I can use uh, to manage a directory full of configuration. And that configuration can be based on any kind of version control system you want. I'm going to be using Git here, but you can use Git or Git. Uh, Git is also a very good choice. So if you want to use Git, that's fine. Uh, there we are, cloning, cloning, and I'll go back here, downloads, unzip, config server, cd, config service, okay, idea, palm.xml. Now, what I've done is I've opened this uh, project, and I've cloned a directory uh, into, the into the file system, so I'm going to point my new config server to that directory on my desktop, home desktop config, and I'll, go, I'll, I'll also say that I want this to run in port 8888. And then I'll say that this is a config service, OK? So I'll start that. And what's going to happen is other microservices will 
identify themselves, they'll connect to the config server, and the config server will give them keys and values that they can use to configure their application. This keeps the configuration outside of the property file. So I can go here to, whoops, localhost 8888, reservation service default, right? So here's the configuration for a microservice called the reservation service. I see there's port 8000, I see a message called hello world, and there's also default values that all microservices will get. This is available to everybody. It's an application.properties, right? Now, if I go back to my reservation service and bring in the Spring Cloud config client dependency here, like so, I can now change my configuration. I can say that the application is called reservation-service. And if I do that, my application will draw its configuration from the config server. It will need to know where to look for it, of course. So I could tell it like this. But this is the default value, the, the 8888. That's what, what I was using before. That's the default value. So I'm not going to bother specifying it, but I want you to know about it. Now, imagine I want to take advantage of that message, message rest controller, right? Pr rest controller, private final string value and enter, and all, all I'm going to do is I'm going to tell Spring to inject this value in the configs, uh, in the constructor for the endpoint here. I'm going to expose that value, I just parrot it out, right, as a message like this, string read. There we are, okay? So all I'm doing is I'm creating an endpoint and it's going to parrot the value. Now I can also manage in wanting to change this value while this service is running. So I'll say at refresh scope and I'll restart the build and I'll take some water. Goodbye. <coughs> Good. So that's up and running. Let's see. <coughs> Let's see if that all works, huh? So 88, 88, sorry, 8,000, right? That's our new service. There we are. Message. There we are. Good. Not great, but good. We can do better. We're not in the world. We're in some place way better than the world. We're in beautiful Berlin, aren't we? So I'm going to go to config. I'm going to open up this property file using Emacs because I'm not a savage. I'm not a savage. So I'll use that. Hello, Berlin. Right, extra exclamation marks so as to reinforce my credentials on, on Reddit. Git commit minus A minus M YOLO. Okay, now if I go to the config server, you can see it says hello Berlin immediately. But my microservice does not know, not yet. I need to tell it to refresh its configuration. And I can do this using another one of those actuator endpoints, those observable endpoints. This one is called refresh. So I'm going to say 8000 forward slash refresh. I'm going to send an empty HTTP post. And what's going to happen is that it's going to recreate that one bean, the refresh scope bean in situ, and redraw the configuration from the config server. Now, I play a little game with the config server to see if I can get there faster than it can get there, but I never win. I never, never win. And I'm kind of fast. I go fast enough, but it's fast. Okay. Okay. Oh. So, <clears throat> what's going to happen is I'm going to hit enter and then alt tab and then control R and see if I can beat it. Ah, fucker. Anyway, it beat me again. So there's the configuration value updated live. I've now I've got this ability to support feature flags. I can decouple the deployment of software from the release of software. I can do A-B testing. I can do all sorts of interesting things. Plus, I can do surgical debugging. I can say, for these nodes or for this node, I want to route it to a particular you know, uh, uh, service or whatever. I want to do isolation. Whatever I can or want to do, I can do there. I have the config server. I can lock down every link in the communication chain for the config server to the Git repository and for the config client to the config server. I can do symmetric encryption and decryption of values in the property file. That's all very well and good. Now, the next thing that I care about in, dis in a distributed system is making it easy for one service to find and talk to another. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons <clears throat> why I want to do this, uh, but in a dynamic system, things come and go all the time, right? So we want to make sure it's easy for these things to find other services. We could use DNS. DNS is certainly a o okay choice, but it has some limitations in a very dynamic cloud environment. The first major limitation uh, is that it's not a very smart protocol. It tells you where something lives. It doesn't tell you if that service is alive, right? That's very important. It's like knowing where my address is, but not knowing if I'm home at, at the moment. What's the point of coming to my apartment or my home if I'm out at the market or something? So that's the first problem. The second thing is that a lot of the languages, a lot of the platforms like Java, uh, that use DNS have very sensible but old defaults. Remember, DNS, and sorry, rather, Java is now 21 years old. It's old enough to drink alcohol in the United States. It has some very sensible default assumptions for 21 years ago, but today, not so much. One of the things that it does poorly is that it, it caches DNS. So if I go to a DNS load balancer, it's going to get the first IP address and then keep hitting that service. It's not going to rotate across the different uh, instances in the pool. 
You can get around that. You can configure things. But the default behavior, you have to undo, right? And if you do call that service, if you call that service with that IP address and it's no longer there, what else do you have to undo? You have to remember to set a timeout because the JDK has abysmal, terribly poor timeouts. It's going to block otherwise forever. So what I want to do is I want to make it easy for services to find each other. I want to be able to control my load balancing approach, right? I don't want to just do an F5 and a checkbox. I want more dynamic options here. Uh, and I also want to get around some of the limitations of DNS. For, for example, the fact that it doesn't know if the service is alive. So I can do that with a service registry. There's a lot of good options out there for service registries. I happen to be a big fan of Netflix Eureka, but you can use Apache Zookeeper, HashiCorp Console, etcd, Cloud Foundry itself are just, just fine, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Netflix Eureka service registry. I'll create one here, Eureka service. Uh, and I'm going to use the config client to configure it. Spring Cloud supports a abstraction that you can use to talk to any service registry you want. So if you choose this one today and you decide to switch to another one tomorrow, just change the jar. The client-side interface is the same, right? So it makes it easy to get all of these benefits integrated throughout the whole stack using the same abstraction and approach. So I'm going to say at enable Eureka server. I'm going to go to my config and give it a name. Spring application name equals Eureka hyphen service. And this is going to spin up, and it's going to start on port 8761. And what I need to do now is I need to tell my reservation service to participate, to say I'm here, to advertise its availability. So I'm going to add the discovery client abstraction to the class path. That's this one here, Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. And then I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to say at enable discovery client. Right, so if I go to my browser, localhost 8761, whoops, you'll see that right now there's no instances yet, but as soon as we re restart, there it is, right? That's uh, available, so, and now advertising its presence. Also worth noticing, amazing, ask, uh, amazing mouse over. That took a long time, but we have doctors on the team that worked on this, so I'm very happy about that. Anyway, we have a single service. It's available now. It's advertising itself, and we can build a client, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a client that will talk to this service, but this is not just any client. This is an edge service, right? So the edge service uh, is going to need certain things. We're going to use Eureka. We're going to use the config server. We're going to use Lumbach again. We're going to use the REST repository support. We're going to use Hystrix, the circuit breaker. We're going to use Zool, the microproxy. Uh, Zipkin for distributed tracing and correlated logging. We're going to use, uh, uh, maybe we want OAuth. Maybe we want RabbitMQ for stream processing. Uh, we want uh, uh, Fane for declarative REST client. We want Actuator, of course, for management endpoints. And I think that's for enough for now. Actually, looking at the time, let's get rid of OAuth. Okay, so we'll keep that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this uh, uh, reservation client. And what we're trying to do here is to build a client that will talk to, a, uh, to, to the outside world. It'll be the first port of call. It'll be the first thing that requests from the outside world see. And the reason is because we don't want to change every single microservice every time we add a new client. Imagine HTML5. HTML5 browsers today are really, really powerful. They can do almost anything. Have you seen JS Linux? JS Linux, Google JS Linux later. It's a Linux distribution that runs entirely in client-side JavaScript. It boots an ISO in the browser. The point is, if somebody says to you, we need to build a native desktop application, you have my permission to call them an unkind name. It's ridiculous at this point. There's no need to. But that said, the browser limits what you can do because it's in a sandbox. It can only make secure requests to single origin sort of uh, origin uh, hosts. You can get around this by adding an access control header to every single service that you call from the browser. But this means that you have to redeploy every single service just to allow the HTML5 browser to talk to it. That's a non-starter. I don't want to end up asking all the other teams in the organization to deploy their services just because I have added a new browser client to the system. So <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll centralize these concerns here at the edge. Right? I'm going to say reservation hyphen client, and I'm going to participate in service registration and discovery. Now, one way to get around that, that browser problem, the sandbox problem, is to use a, a proxy. A micro proxy. So I'll use at enable Zool proxy and I'll start this up. Now, Zool, as you know, as you probably know, is, is the Ghostbusters guardian of the underworld. This is the monster that guarded the gate to the underworld in the Ghostbusters movie, the first one from, from the 80s. Zool is from Netflix. They're a movie company. It's a movie, it's a proxy. Never mind, it's fine. Give it some time. So we have now started this up, and what this is going to do is it's going to work with my registry. It's going to work with the registry because it knows about the, the service registry because it has the abstraction right here, right? It's going to work with the registry, and it's going to serve all of the reservations from port 8000 
forward slash reservations on the edge service at 9999 reservation hyphen service reservation. So there's two things happening here. First of all, the proxy is using this, the context ID in the browser path to figure out which service to call. But which one is it calling? Right now, I only have one. So yeah, it's choosing that one. But what if I had two or 10 or 1,000? How would it pick? Right? It's not doing, there's no, there's no load balancer here. Right? So something has to make the decision about which node to call. That's something called Netflix Ribbon. Netflix Ribbon is a client-side load balancer. It was created by Netflix. It's a technology that they have. And remember, they already had elastic you know, load balancers from AWS. They already knew about that. They still created it because what they wanted to do was to control the load balancing, to have programmatic access to the load balancing decisions. And so the default behavior is round robin, so that's fine, or LRU, that kind of thing. You, know, you can do st session affinity. You can even do more complicated or more nuanced things. You can do data center aware load balancing. You can do rack aware load balancing. You can do data locality, data sharding. You could do, you know, here's an OAuth token, and the token belongs to Josh, and he's watching a video on this particular node, so route the request to that node. Whatever strategy you want, you can write a, co you can write a strategy for it unit test it, version control it, and then plug it in. Spring Cloud will use it. By default, it's using round robin load balancing. The other thing is that these URLs are correct. See, this is the edge service. That's the origin. That's the edge, origin, ad, ed, origin, edge, origin, edge, right? It's changing the URL by sending an origin header in the request with the proxy. So the, the actual service is rewriting its JSON. The browser or the HTML5 device or the iPhone or the Android device, they don't know that that JSON came from another service on another machine. They, they think it came from the node that they contacted. Is this enough? Maybe. If I have a homogeneous set of services and they're all HTTP, maybe that's enough. But sometimes I want to adapt the data from my downstream services into a single unified view. I want to have a synthetic view of maybe service A and service B, and I want to create a new service called service C. Maybe I need to do payload or protocol uh, translation or transformation. In this case, it's not enough just to send the data back and forth without changing it. I want to transform. I want to create a, a new view of the data. This is called an API adapter. It's something that is an endpoint that is, serves only a particular client, right? So let's create a simple API adapter uh, that adapts my downstream reservation service and just returns a collection of string names, right? So you remember all of our names? Those names we want to keep, but we don't want the rest of the, uh, the payload. We don't want the envelope resource envelope object, right? So we're going to call this a names endpoint. I'm going to say at risk controller. I'm going to map this to reservation. So it's going to be localhost 9999 forward slash reservations forward slash names, OK? Now, I could use the Spring Framework REST template. Here we are, right? I could do that. That's the uh, HTTP client in Spring, and that would work. But it doesn't know about our service registry, right? So I need to make it aware. I need to create a bean of that type like so. This is an object that I'm telling Spring to create, and I'm telling it to create an, a load balancing aware REST template. So now in my REST code, I can actually say, you know, REST template.exchange, HTTP, reservation hyphen service, right? I'm not using DNS. This is the service ID. That's not going to a DNS server. That goes to Eureka, it goes to Ribbon. So those are all plugged in for me. It's going to get pre-processed, and then all of that load balancing is done on the client right before the request is made. That would work, I guess. But this is very low level. This is low level HTTP you know, packets and payloads and headers and all that stuff. I want to move up a little bit. I want to have my own client, a declarative client that I can use. Uh, and I don't want to have too much business logic you know, duplicated in every single time that somebody calls my service. I want to have that in one place. Right? I want to be as simple to understand as possible. So I'm going to create a reservation client. I'm going to use a technology called Fane. Fane is also from Netflix. We have this on the class path here, right? Fane. There it is, Fane. Fane in English means to pretend or to act as, uh, to, to uh, act as. So if you are in the forest and you see an animal laying down with its head, you know, cocked back like this and its tongue hanging out and its poor little heart is beating really fast. It's scared. It doesn't want you to bother it. It's scared, so it's pretending to be dead. It's not actually dead. It's feigning death. In the same way that WebSphere is not useful, it actually just pretends. It's feigning utility, right? It's, it wants you to leave it alone, like the animal in the forest. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a declarative client here. We're going to use uh, the Spring Hypermedia support, which I need to bring in. So Spring Boot Starter Data Rest. Okay, there's this. And I'm going to say, give me a collection of hypermedia 
envelope objects, right? These are the envelope, um, pay <coughs> the envelope thing that has the links and the payload from our previous JSON. I'm going to create a client endpoint. I'm going to map it using server-side Spring MVC mapping annotations. So here, it's an object. I don't have to implement it. Spring will implement it for me, and I can just call the read method. It's going to call the registry. It'll get all the service instances. It'll load balance across the instances, and then it'll return the JSON from calling an HTTP get uh, call on that endpoint. The one thing it doesn't have is the client-side representation of that entity. Remember, on the, on the service implementation, it's a uh, JPA entity, and I don't want to copy and paste that because I don't want JPA on my client-side class path, right? So I'm going to use Lombok here again, <coughs> create a little getter, a DTO that I can use to transfer objects. Now, let's try this. Let's use our, our entity here thing. Final reservation. Client. Okay, now there we are. Okay, so there we are. There's our, our endpoint. And I'm going to return uh, client.read.getContent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just transform it. I'm going to map every single record that comes back and turn it into a collection of string names, right? I'm not going to bother keeping all of the JSON. So if we now run this code, you'll see Okay. <clears throat> Localhost reservation names. Come on, computer. There we are. There's our names, huh? So that worked. It's okay. It's going to do the right thing if there are one or more instances of that service. But what if there are zero instances of that service? We're going to try and load balance across zero instances. That's uh, very similar to dividing by zero. And we all know what happens if you divide by zero, right? What is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. You can't divide by zero. It's a bad idea. You'll make Cookie Monster sad. So we need to prepare for the eventuality that this will fail. And it will. High-performing organizations understand that fact. They know that things are going to fail, and they prepare accordingly. So I have a, a dependency here. It's causing uh, output on the console. I'm going to disable it for now. Goodbye for now. Okay. And so what they do is they degrade it gracefully whenever they can, right? Google does this, Netflix does this. They build fail, uh, failure into the system to fail gracefully. So I'm going to use a circuit breaker to achieve that effect. I'm going to use a circuit breaker. And I'm going to say, whenever somebody calls this names method, I want to have a fallback method that will get called if something goes wrong. High-performing websites do this kind of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, well, you called a, um, the search engine, but it's not available right now. So here are some machine-learned recommendations, right? Is it what you wanted? No, not exactly. But it's better than nothing, isn't it? It's better than a big, fat, ASCII middle finger, certainly. So we have to prepare for that eventuality by architecting our code appropriately. So now let's suppose I go to the reservation service here. Uh, where's my service? Here. And I kill it. Okay, empty array list. It didn't throw an exception, didn't give me a status code. Ten minutes. It didn't, didn't throw me an exception, didn't do any of that stuff. It just gave me uh, an empty array list. And eventually, when I restart that application, it'll resynchronize with the registry and it'll re-register itself. Now, if you're using a cloud platform, something like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will work all day and all night. If you say, I want to have 10 instances of that service running at all times, no matter what, guaranteed it'll start them up and make sure that it has 10 instances. If your code falls down, it'll pick it back up again. It doesn't sleep, it doesn't eat, it, does, it just goes and goes and goes, right? It'll move heaven and earth to make sure that you are able to sleep through the night. But it's our job as developers and architects to build our system to do the right thing in the face of failure, in the face of possible outages. We all know that... <clears throat> You know, we, 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 the last thing that we want to do is overwhelm that service when it's trying to come back online, right? That circuit breaker is stateful. It sees that you've made enough requests. It sees that you made maybe two or three or you know, enough sub subsequent requests and that they have failed. So it's going to move the train tracks. It'll switch the train track to the fallback directly. It'll pre prevent you from overwhelming that downstream service while it's trying to recover. We all know that if a website is really slow, the best thing you should do is to refresh the browser, right? Does that work? Of course not, right? And the same is true for your distributed system. So this circuit breaker is very smart. Now, eventually it heals itself and you're fine, right? No problems. Now, 
we have an application that's robust in the face of service outages and topology changes. It's elastic. It takes advantage of the, the dynamic nature of a cloud. It's agile, and it's also a little observable. We talked about observability for this service level, but what about the system as a whole? We haven't really talked about that, have we? If I'm walking around here in beautiful Berlin on this beautiful day, is that the same thing as looking at the Google map for Berlin? Of course not, right? Being in Berlin is so much more beautiful and alive and vivid and uh, wonderful and memorable than looking at the Google map. Not the, this is, these are not the same things. The, the map is not the terrain. The same is true for your architecture. Your architecture diagram is not the same as your production system. There is emergent behavior that you must capture in production. Otherwise, you risk not understanding what the true nature of your system. You can't use that observability to then drive change because it would be based on a lie. So you need to capture that emergent behavior. One place where we have uh, sort of you know, cross-communication or cross-services is the circuit breaker. This circuit breaker represents a connective tissue, a line between my service and some other service managed by some other team or some other company. I can't change other people's code. I cannot add my monitoring infrastructure to their systems. I can't do that. I can't change everything. As an optimist, I'm being an optimist. I'm a happy guy. I'm a very optimistic person. I know that everybody else will fail me all the time, right? The pessimist would say that there's nothing I can do about it, though. I don't say that. I say I can monitor the relationships, the connections from my services to their services. That circuit breaker is a nice place to capture that observability. It represents a state between my service and their service. So if the circuit is open, then requests are not traveling from my service to their service. That tells me that by proxy, their service is broken. So I can use a Hystrix dashboard, a circuit breaker dashboard, to capture information and to visualize uh, about uh, the, uh, the dashboard, the circuit breaker in my system, or the circuit breakers, right? So let's go here, unzip Hystrix dashboard, cd Hystrix dashboard idea pom.xml. Open up this property file. Spring application name, Hystrix dashboard. OK, very good, Hystrix dashboard application. And we'll say at enable discovery client, at enable Hystrix dashboard, and we are go. Okay. Et voila. So that dashboard is going to be listening on port 8010 forward slash Hystrix.html. It needs a stream that it can use to monitor. So that stream is generated for us automatically. Let me uh, grab that. Okay. We're going to. It needs a stream that it can use to, to monitor the flow of data through that circuit. And that circuit breaker uh, pr produ produces a new value. I need to actually make a request, don't I? Uh, uh, da, da, da. There we are. OK. Hello. It's trying to format it, which is not what we want. Oh well. That, that stream produces a new value every second. It's a service end event heartbeat stream, right? And so it's going to go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's infinite. It has no end. It's endless like the skies and the oceans and the stars and the bugs in your code. Just infinite. Forever and ever and ever. So whatever you do, my friends, whatever you do, do not curl that endpoint. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make requests here on the left, and I'll see the moving average trending ever upwards on the right. It shows me that through that circuit, there's 39 requests, 45, et cetera, 51. But it's a moving average. So if I let go, the gas goes down, and it says it's going to trend downwards. <clears throat> if I kill the downstream service, this will say open instead of closed. That's one way to get the visibility that we're talking about. Now, it's not the only way. Remember, uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, now it's giving me new values every second. Darn it. Uh, the other way to get that emergent, that emergent behavior is to do distributed or correlated tracing. What I want to do is for every request anywhere in the system to add a unique correlated ID and then to trace that ID as it flows from one node to another to another. In theory, this is very simple, but it requires that we change all of our code everywhere. Anytime you make a REST request or you use, for example, RabbitMQ or Apache Kafka, anytime you do any kind of RPC, anywhere in the system, you have to have this tracing for it to be effective. And it has to work for all services, otherwise you'll have gaps in your trace tree, right? 
So we can support that. Spring Cloud Sleuth supports that. It has, it's an abstraction in Spring Cloud that works with uh, uh, different services. In part particular, we have an implementation that works with Zipkin. Now, Zipkin is a distributed tracing tool from Twitter. We are very lucky on the Spring Cloud team. We have contributors from both Netflix and from Twitter who have helped make Spring Cloud awesome. So Zipkin uh, is easy to set up. We're going to do that here. Zipkin uh, UI, OK, generate. Go to the console here. Unzip Zipkin service, cd Zipkin hyphen service, idea pom.xml. And it's going to spin up application.properties, bring application name, Zipkin hyphen hyphen service. Zipkin service application, at enable discovery client. There we are. Oh, I forgot one nut. Let me see here. OK, Zipkin hyphen server. Now, that Zip Zipkin server is very important. That Zipkin server is the API that powers Zipkin. And it provides this annotation, at enable Zipkin server. Now, you notice that that annotation is a Spring Boot annotation. That's because Zipkin itself is written using Spring Boot. The REST API uses Spring Boot. So it's a uh, purpose built, I guess, for this kind of thing. OK, so there we go. We're going to start that up. In order for that to work, our reservation service and our reservation client need the client you know, um, pointer, or the client library for Zipkin. And you, you notice that before, I just commented those out, but I'll bring those back in. Okay, Here we are. There's the, um, this is the uh, service, isn't it? So we'll start that up. And we want the client here. Okay, and we're going to bring that in as well. Okay. Goody. So, that's not it. Sometimes my, pa my class path on my application doesn't reflect as fast as I restart it, which is a bummer. So, local host, reservation, come on. There we go. There's my names, right? I'm making requests through the edge service going down to the downstream service. Now, if I go to the Zipkin server, I can see that it is aware of my services. It sees the client and the service. I can click on either one, hit Find Trace. And uh, when I do that, I get a waterfall graph. The first request, for some reason, is always freakishly long. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, exceptional. Ignore that one. Everything else is normal, right? So here's the requests that have gone into the system. This request started at the reservation client. It then, some milliseconds later, went to the reservation service. Uh, it's a waterfall graph. So if I click on each one of these little waterfall graph nodes, I get context about the request, the in and out log, the, the, the timestamps, and tags. These tags down here are metadata about the request itself. They show me when the request was made, when it stopped. Uh, you know, it shows me what component processed it, what thread pool it was on, etc. It gives me visibility into the flow of data through the system, not just individual nodes. Both the Histrix dashboard and the Zipkin distributed tracing support are for uh, online telemetry. They're all about right now, not warehousing. I don't know how much money we made last quarter, but this can tell me what the average latency on the website is for the last hour. That's what I'm trying to get here. That's what this gives me, is it at a glance, observability, and status. Now, we are, I think, about to run out of time. I wish we had more time, my friends then we could actually talk about something. We didn't even get to talk about anything this time, really. We talked about um, how to build applications that are elastic, that are agile, that are robust, and that are observable. We looked at uh, centralized configuration. We looked at Spring Boot itself. We looked at actuator and observability. We looked at uh, client-side load balancing. We looked at circuit breakers, uh, service registration and discovery. We looked at um, uh, distributed tracing. We looked at the uh, distrib Histrix dashboard. But if we had more time, we'd also look at how to do uh, services that are integration test friendly. That is to say, if I have a unit test in my code for one node, I can mock an object. How do I do the same thing for my service if I want to mock out a whole REST API? For this, you use consumer-driven contracts and consumer-driven contract testing. And for that, we could have talked about Spring Cloud Contract. If we wanted to talk about how to secure our APIs, our, our services, and, and protect them against uh, unauthenticated clients, like HTML5 browsers and iPhone devices and so on, we could have talked about OAuth and Spring Cloud Security, which would have made it dead simple to protect all of our APIs. If we wanted to talk about eventual consistency in messaging, we could have used Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, and used Spring Cloud Stream to do that as well. That would have been something we could have talked about. If we wanted to compose our small messaging-based microservices into higher order functions, uh, streams, we could have looked at Spring Cloud Dataflow, which allows us to use a bash like Pipes and Filters DSL to build streams of functionality out of messaging-based microservices. We could have we done that. 
right? We could have done all of this and so much more using Spring Cloud. Now, I'm a big fan. Obviously, I like Spring. I'm wearing the Spring T-shirt and the Spring underwear. Of course, I'm a fan, but I hope you uh, like it as well. You don't have to take my word for it, though. There are, are some small mom-and-pop shops that are using the Pivotal stack to great effect. So if, if Amazon.com is the Alibaba of the far west, then Rakuten.com is the Alibaba of the further east. Rakuten.com is in Japan. It's an e-commerce engine. They're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud and Cloud Foundry at scale to build services. Uh, in China, there is that aforementioned e-commerce giant. There's Alibaba. They're using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud for their services at scale, and they've talked about it loudly and proudly. There's another company, another small company that I believe one day will be quite big There's in China called Baidu. Now, they're also using Cloud Foundry, Spring Boot, and Spring Cloud at scale. These organizations are trying to go faster, right? Uh, in, in the West, you know, most of the banks that you can, you can think of are using uh, Cloud Foundry. They're using Spring Boot, and now soon, hopefully, more Spring Cloud. We see a lot of that in the West already. Well, further west, right? But it's, it's starting to become such a, such a thing that even the banks realize that they need this competitive edge. So they're using Spring Cloud. Uh, we see in the west also the internet darlings, you know, the, 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 uh, the stars of the internet, like Netflix, for example. Netflix is using Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, and they've talked about this in their talks loudly and proudly at conferences and so on. They and all these other organizations have the money, they have the motivation, they have the smart people, and they could solve these problems by themselves if they needed to but they still choose, whenever possible, especially for new stuff, to build on the Pivotal stack because this allows them to get to production faster. And for them and most of these organizations out there, that, at the end of the day, is all that matters. Thank you very much for your time, my friends. I hope you have a wonderful day and a great OSDC. Thanks for having me. Cheers. If you have questions, we didn't cover a lot, but if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. I think we can do one question because we're running out of time. I can sit outside too, by yeah, the way. Lunch is waiting for us. Do anyone have some questions? There must be some. Did I answer all the questions? Did you, did you see anything interesting? Thumbs up, down? I don't know about these conferences. I feel like I'm the only apps talk at this thing, and I want to make sure we're on the same page. Thank you very much for that.